Our island is in a period of transition, a time of change and a time of renewal. Our people need to be confident that their governor is making decisions to keep our finances stable and to prepare for the future. Our island needs to know that hope and opportunity for families and our future generations are always on our minds and that whatever conditions the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration inherited, we are moving forward, charting a course with innovation, modernization, transparency, accountability, and excellence in government service. We can measure the current state of our island by how much trust people have in their leaders. We can measure the state of our island by how safe people feel in their homes, on their streets, and in their daily activities. We can measure it by how many people have access to quality, affordable health care. And we can measure the state of our island by the opportunities we create to help people improve their lives. The state of our island is what I am able to affirm today, and it is this. We are here now, and the state of our island is promising. I know that Governor Leon Guerrero believes the state of our island is promising. But I'm here to tell you today the state of our island is anything but promising. The state of our island is on fire, especially government of Guam. Our government has a burn rate of over $2 million a day. And taxpayers can't afford to wait until the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration figures out how government works before taking action. In her State of the Island address last week, the governor spent way too much time telling us how great her team was and not enough time telling us what her team was doing. And this is very important when you consider the fact that just prior to her State of the Island address, the governor of Guam broke Calvo's budget-busting billion-dollar budget with an even bigger budget of her own, $966 million. Let's put that budget into perspective. Our island is basically a low-wage service economy. 87% of the employees on Guam make less than $40,000 a year. 60% of households, all incomes combined, make less than $50,000 a year, even with multiple income streams. And then Governor Leon Guerrero's budget breaks down to a budget debt per household of a staggering $21,000 $673. That's of a hell of a burden to place on a population that has suffered a 30% increase in the cost of living over the past few years with no increases in wages to offset those increased living costs. There were a lot of things that we did not hear in the State of the Island address, and I was struck by how little we heard about GMH. Because on the campaign trail, the governor emphatically declared that she was going to make GMH a priority of her administration. But in her State of the Island address, we didn't hear anything from her regarding the $30 million budget deficit that Guam Memorial is running because the Calvo administration didn't fund it. And in her budget for 2020, we didn't see... $20 million appropriated to cover the $30 million deficit for 2020. What that tells me is that in 2021, we're going to hear from the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration the need to borrow $60 million just to pay the hospital's operating deficit to prevent Tan Maria from being pushed out of the emergency room into the parking lot. 
It's the same playbook that the Calvo Tenorio administration used when they tried to borrow hundreds of millions of dollars several times. I also noticed that the governor didn't say anything about how she plans to pay for the new labor and delivery room because there's nothing in the budget for it, nor did she say how she was going to pay for the replacement of the main panel at the hospital because I saw nothing in the budget for that as well. I am hearing stories that the government is looking at raising fees. The justification being that there are many fees that are paid to government in Guam that haven't been raised in more than 20 years. That's a bad thing for the people of Guam who are struggling from paycheck to paycheck with the current level of fees. If we're struggling with the current level of fees, what's going to happen when they start increasing fees across the board? What will happen is we end up pushing more of our people deeper into poverty. I keep hearing stories that the government of Guam is getting ready to reappraise all the property on the island. And there's two reasons the government would want to do this. The first reason is raising the property appraisals will raise the property taxes. The second reason is raising the property appraisals will also raise the borrowing limit for government of Guam and will give them room to borrow their way out of trouble, leaving our children and great-grandchildren to make the payments. And that would be a very bad mistake. Because right now, one in four tax dollars collected is used to pay bond debt service. That's not money going to fix roads or buy textbooks. It's used to pay interest and debt service. We can't afford to let that number get any higher. I have to say that after listening to the Governor's State of the Island address, I'm disappointed because the first year of a governor's term is the most productive year. And as far as I'm concerned, the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration got off on the wrong foot and wasted the first 100 days of their administration. Instead of sticking to the priorities that the governor outlined in her campaign and in her post-election commitments, she spent a lot of time, money, and political capital on things that did not help Guam in the long term. Instead of reaching for the low-hanging fruit and collecting tremendous amounts of delinquent fees, unpaid taxes, and using that money to improve the technology of the government to make the government more efficient, they wasted their political capital legalizing cannabis, something the federal government is on the road to doing itself. And legalizing cannabis is not going to add any revenue to the Treasury of Guam for years. They also spent time and political capital legalizing casino gambling for 60 days at the Liberation Day Carnival. It's not going to add anything to the Treasury of Guam and will raise less than $600,000 to pay the expenses of the carnival. Neither of these initiatives will solve the major financial problems facing our island today. There is a big difference between campaigning and governing. And if Governor Leon Guerrero was really going to be the change she campaigned she would be, she would have approached her the first 100 days of her administration differently. What reason do taxpayers have to pay taxes due when due when they see how politically well-connected insiders are able to avoid paying taxes with no penalty? So if she really was going to change things, as she said she would, on the first day of her administration, she would have revoked Midpac's business license until all $14 million of taxes owed are paid with interest and penalties. Instead, the administration is waiving penalties and interest 
and they're probably going to let MidPAC pay over a number of years. So by doing that, they're shifting the burden of operating government of Guam from the tax delinquent company to the backs of taxpayers who regularly pay their taxes due when due. And that sends the wrong message. Because if she had done that, if she had revoked that business license and collected the taxes due and penalties and interest, it would have allowed her to keep another campaign promise that she made to address the needs for GMH. GMH needs a new computer system. That's part of the reason why they are out of compliance with the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare. The new computer system will cost $10 million. Installation and training will cost about $4 million. Just collecting the unpaid taxes from MidPAC will help her solve an issue critical to GMH, one that prevents them from being recertified and eligible for higher reimbursement rates. If she was going to be the change she campaigned she would be, on the second day of her administration, the governor would have announced that there are $40 million in uncollected property taxes, and landowners have until the end of the month to contact land management and start the process to clear up the property titles and make payment arrangements on the delinquent taxes, penalties, and interest. And at the end of 60 days, those properties that have not contacted land management and made arrangements to pay taxes, penalties, and interest will be sold at auction, with the upset price being, of course, taxes due with penalties and interest. If she had done that, this would have allowed the governor to keep another campaign promise, which was to modernize government of Guam's ancient computer system. The existing system is older than most of the people working on it today. Collecting the $40 million in delinquent property taxes would have allowed the governor to buy a new state-of-the-art computer system and get it installed without increasing public debt. On the third day of her administration, the governor should have announced we are sending revenue agents to shut down all unlicensed short-term vacation rentals until such time as the businesses are registered, inspected, brought up to code, and have paid all taxes, fees, penalties, and interest due. The money that that effort would have collected would have allowed her to keep another campaign promise which was to restore the $3.8 million back to the E911 fund, which would restore trust between government of Guam, the Federal Communications Administration, and the Department of Interior, proving that our politicians are capable of following federal funding guidelines. On the fourth day of the new administration, the governor should have announced she will ask the legislature to repeal the special property tax bill because it increases rents in apartment buildings, that it's going to drive up rent for the local people living there. And government of Guam is one of the largest tenants in commercial buildings, and by raising the taxes, we're raising the rents on the government. The governor should announce that by focusing on collecting taxes due when due, there will be no need for this bill the special increase on property to over $1 million in value. And she should be able to close that $8 million funding gap, as she said she would in her campaign. On the fifth day of her administration, the governor should have announced that she has directed revenue and tax to audit all EITC tax returns. Studies by the Internal Revenue Service show that the error rate leading to overpayment or fraud is nearly 30%. Well, for government of Guam, that 30% represents the potential recovery of $20 million or more. If the governor had said her administration will work 
on reducing EITC overpayments and fraud with more tax audits, that is money that could be used to close the budget gap with Guam Memorial Hospital. On the sixth day of the new administration, the governor could have announced that she has issued an executive order that all vehicles not assigned to emergency service, field work, or public health and safety will be reassigned to Department of Public Safety to be used as police vehicles. There is no reason why directors, deputy directors, or administrators need a government vehicle and a government gas card to do their job. But there is a need by the Department of Public Safety for more police vehicles. And by transferring these non-critical vehicles over to the Department of Public Safety, we can improve operations without increasing cost. And at the same time, she should have announced that she was directing agency heads to reduce their cost of operations by 5%. And if the only way they can reduce their cost of operations by 5% is by reducing staff, then they are to submit a list of employees that will need to be relocated into other jobs within government of Guam to fill vital vacancies in uh, Department of Public Safety, Guam Fire, Department of Corrections, Public Health, Revenue Tax, and Department of Education. And these people would get the training they need to fill those positions. On the seventh day of the new administration, the governor could have said it is time to recognize our people are struggling. Our economy is a largely based on low wage service jobs and the nearest competitive labor market is 7,000 miles away. So therefore our people are trapped in these low-wage service jobs, so it's time to recognize the need to increase the minimum wage because as the cost of living is rising at double-digit rates on an annual basis, many of our hard-working people are being pushed into poverty unless we step in to make changes. On the eighth day of the new administration, Governor Leon Guerrero could have said that tourism is vital to our economy. It represents 30% of our GDP, and we are competing with destinations to attract tourists. We need to focus on what makes Guam unique, and that is the beauty of our island and our culture. But our product is being tarnished by panhandlers at every major intersection and along the side of the roads. It is dangerous for both residents and tourists alike. So we are going to make it illegal to create a safety hazard by panhandling on the side of the road or on the, tr the islands, and we are going to enforce that law. Our image is further tarnished by homeless people hanging out all day at tourist destinations. So we are going to set up a homeless shelter to provide support for homeless people. It will be located away from our primary tourist areas and we will set it up to provide assistance and services needed to help our homeless get back on their feet. We're going to make sure our public parks are clean and safe. We're going to make sure the restrooms are clean and safe. We're going to add more public restrooms where restrooms are needed. And it's not just for the benefit of the tourists. It's also for the benefits of our local residents as well. By working to improve the quality of the tourism experience here on Guam, our visitors will return home and tell wonderful stories about their time on Guam, and hopefully uh, their friends and families will come to see and share in that experience. On the 10th day of the new administration, the governor could have announced plans to introduce a universal health care coverage for Guam. Right now, one-third of our population is on Medicaid or MIP. And in 2017, Governor Calvo said the primary reason GMH was having financial difficulties 
was that 75% of the patients didn't have adequate health care coverage. Guam is experiencing a skyrocketing rate of chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, cancer, and high blood pressure that are affecting every family on our island. And part of the reason these disease rates are escalating so fast, much faster than the United States, is the lack of affordable health care coverage here on the island. This results in many people waiting until their conditions go critical enough for them to be seen in the emergency room. That makes Guam Memorial Hospital's emergency room the highest cost provider of medical services. It makes it the uninsured primary care provider. And that's not a sustainable operation. In the 1970s, the state of Hawaii introduced a universal health care coverage. Today, 97% of their residents are covered with health care, and the state's residents have the longest lifespan of any state in the nation. We could do the same thing here on Guam with our own form of universal health care. Instead of saying that, one of the governor's first acts was to force insurance companies bidding for the government contract to provide mandatory coverage for the financially struggling Guam Regional Medical Center. This is an act that will divert patients with insurance coverage away from the taxpayer-supported hospital to a private investor-supported hospital, ensuring that hospital's profits at taxpayer expense. This could ultimately lead to Guam Memorial Hospital being forced to close its doors. And that is not something we want to see happen here on Guam. But instead of fixing health care, the governor's team is introducing legislation that, re that will allow insurance providers to provide two options instead of one. One, the sole provider option, and one, the shared provider option. That's going to cost taxpayers millions of dollars more than the existing law, which requires the most economical health care plan. And bear in mind, those tax dollars that will end up paying for the bulk of the insurance for government employees, a lot of that money comes from taxpayers who don't have any health coverage themselves. So we need to focus on a universal care program and that will bring down the cost of coverage for everyone. And on the 10th day, the governor could have announced that her administration is going to make it a priority to create a real mass transit system here on Guam, like the one they have in Hawaii. Guam is logistically suited to have one of the best mass transit systems in the United States, if only the government was willing to let that happen. And the beautiful thing about a mass transit, a well-run mass transit system designed from the ground up to serve commuters is that it will provide people with disabilities with a service that is better than any service that has ever been on Guam before. Giving the employees on Guam an option to drive their car or ride the bus those that ride the bus could see a dramatic reduction in their personal cost of living, which will improve their quality of life. These are the things she could have said and done, but didn't. And if she had said those things, she could have ended her speech paraphrasing one of JFK's famous lines. We choose to do these things, not because they are easy, but because they are badly needed. We do them because when you voted for us to be your governor and lieutenant governor, we accepted the challenge to do the hard work and difficult things that must be done if we are going to improve the quality of life for everyone that calls Guam home. But she said none of these things and did none of these things, proving that her administration is beginning to look like so many others that have come before it, more concerned about supporting the needs of politically well-connected insiders than the needs of the people. 
So now we're going to have to watch the administration closely and hold them accountable for keeping the promises they made to us in an effort to get our vote. Because now that they are governing, it's time for them to keep those promises. I'm Ken Leon Guerrero, and this has been a Guam Citizens for Public Accountability presentation.